Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Olin Hahn. So she's also from the Department of Medicine section of hematology or oncology. She's an associate professor of medicine. Um, she uh, specializes in uh, breast cancer for her clinical care and then her research interests, and you could explain more obviously, but Dr. Hahn, but focus on um, uh, clinical trial, national clinical trial accrual and management. Um, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Hahn. All right, great, thanks. Um, so yeah, so I am a, a medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer. And so I'm just gonna give you guys kind of a bird's eye view of th things that we think about as medical oncologists when we are approaching a patient that has cancer and how we should design an appropriate treatment plan for them. Um, a lot of my examples will be in breast cancer, but um, I think it will be applicable to other types of cancer. And so kind of just a general outline, you know, I was gonna talk about a little about, about why we give therapy, how we think about the therapies we give, and then the different types of therapies. We have the old school cytotoxic chemotherapy. We have these new targeted therapies, which now precision medicine or precision therapies and some of the development of those. And then kind of along the lines of uh, Dr. Olapati talking about having more precision in, in identifying risk in patients, also having more precision in identifying which patient in um, which treatment are the best match and which, which patient is going to gain the benefit from our various therapies. So in Dr. Olapati's talk, you know, she talked a lot about kind of on the left-hand side of the slide, kind of in the risk slide. And as medical oncologists, we work a lot on the, on the right-hand hand side, where a patient who you know, has kind of gone through a, a pre-malignant malignant condition and developed breast cancer, and we get involved when invasive ductal carcinoma or cancer is um, diagnosed. And we do a lot of kind of staging and workup to find out the anatomic stage. And to figure out, you know, what is the goal of our treatment? Of our, is our treatment curative where we're trying to treat the micrometastatic disease or if the patient has what we call um, metastatic disease or stage four the goals of our treatment are more more along the lines of the palliative realm and so in terms of you know we as Bumi said we do a lot of work in anatomic staging um, I think we're moving towards in especially in breast cancer, our staging is incorporating anatomic staging as well as more biologic features. Um, so we can have a um, more of a prognostic stage. But one, I think one of the reasons we have spent a lot of time on anatomic stage, especially in the solid tumors, and this is not your um, leukemias or lymphomas, is that the way we think about treatments and decide on the appropriate treatments plan for our patient is really based on their anatomic stage and whether that we consider the patient to be potentially curable or not. And so this is kind of an old graph of kind of survival by stage in non-small cell lung cancer. And as you see in the earlier stages, um, non-small cell lung cancer is, can, has a higher cure rate, but in the later stages in stage four metastatic, the, their five-year survival is not as good. The rub that used, used to be is that we used to not find many patients in stage one and stage two. However, now we begin to start kind of lung cancer screening based on smoking risk. And so we will probably will see an increased incidence in patients being picked up here. But as you see, the types of treatments when we are in our earlier stages, our curative setting are more local regional. So surgery, surgery and radiation, may be combined with chemotherapy to again treat that micrometastatic disease whereas in the later stages we are kind of simply doing primarily more chemotherapy so in terms of what is our intent or what is the purpose of the treatments as medical oncologists that we give and um, in the early stages our treatments is, and this is kind of a lot what Dr. Hoffman talked about last week, is, is a curative intent. We are giving patients therapy in order that they can possibly survive their cancer. They're a cancer survivor. And, you know, we think about very carefully about the stage and the biology of the cancer and thinking about what would be the appropriate combination of surgery, radiation, or systemic therapies. 
And then when we give systemic therapy in the neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting, and that just means either before or after surgery, the goal of it is to kind of treat this micrometastatic disease so patients won't have recurrent disease in other um, organs of the body. And our decisions about, you know, who to treat, what, what treatments, do we, what kind of therapy really depends on the biology of the cancer, the risk and benefits of our various treatments, um, what kind of patient factors, what are their comorbidities, and who we can, and also we want to think about and the, a lot of the things in breast cancer is who we could peel back treatment for. Some of our treatments can have a significant amount of morbidity. Who can we safely peel back from some of our therapies without compromising our rate of cure? In the advanced disease or stage four in solid tumors, our treatments are palliative. And so there our oncologists will be talking about depending on the disease and depending on the line of treatment, the treatment hopefully will improve patients' overall survival, how long they are able to live with their cancer, progression-free survival, which is a term that how long they're able to live without their cancer growing or spreading to different other organs, as well as having to shrink the cancer to improve cancer-related symptoms. So, in for our stage four patients, uh, most of the therapies are systemic therapies, so that is either a combination of IV therapies, either kind of chemotherapy, cytotoxic chemotherapies, maybe targeted therapies, maybe our immunotherapies now. Local therapy, like surgery or radiation, has a, can have a role, primarily in the palliative setting, and I think when Dr. Golden gives a radiation talk, he'll talk a little bit more about that. So these are the different buckets of therapies that we talk about, um, cytotoxic therapy, endocrine therapy, our targeted therapies, and a lot of times some of these therapies can be combined depending on the specific disease, and a lot of the side effect profiles really varies versus the different type of therapy. Um, and so, you know, one of uh, the kind of the take-home messages is that you know, how we have developed the various therapies or established the standard um, of care really depends on very well-designed clinical trials. And one of the things I've done since being a faculty member is I've been working with an NCI cooperative group now called the Alliance, where our goal is to, it's a consortium of academic centers where we work with investigators and leading academic sites to develop their ideas for our clinical trials to, um, to develop new drugs and execute them, um, sponsored by our taxpayer dollars, to throughout the nation in order to um, systematically test and determine what is the best um, therapy. However, and this is a little bit, well, we'll talk about our trials, all clinical trials that we need to do need to have a strong scientific rationale. And you'll see some of the greatest achievements in breast um, in any type of oncologies because we've had done a lot of work in the lab or before to understand the disease biology as well as the mechanism of the therapies that we're treating. And so, you know, this is kind of really the key to understanding before we can begin to design um, clinical trials for therapies in cancer. So, I am want to briefly touch about cytotoxic chemotherapy. But I don't want to give you heart palpitations because you'll see this when you have pharmacology that's taught by my colleague, Dr. O'Donnell, next year. But, you know, old school, when I was in medical school, this was kind of what we had in terms of um, uh, pharmacology for cancer. It was a lot of our old school IV chemotherapies. They would slap up the cell cycle. And we, a lot of our drugs were kind of um, were worked because they either inhibited the um, DNA synthesis that happened during um, the cell cycle, or they inhibited division of the cell. And so kind of drugs were grouped into kind of where their activity was. And some of the drugs were cell cycle independent, such as our platinum and alkyl um, alkylating agents. This was like very much a slide that I would see in my second year of medical school. Fortunately, we've gone beyond that. And in terms of when we talk about our chemotherapies, our cytotoxic chemotherapy, 
the idea was is that cancer, in the majority of cases, cancer cells were rapidly dividing. And these drugs would differentially um, affect cells that were rapidly dividing and not as much defect cells that were not rapidly dividing. And so thus they were active in killing cancer cells. However, we do have normal cells that are actively dividing and thus you have some of the toxicity. Uh, hair, your hair follicles, your GI tract, that's why you can have some diarrhea or some sloughing of your mucosal in your mouth, as well as in your bone marrow, your red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And thus some of the common toxicities of the old school IV chemotherapies were myelosuppression, decreasing your counts, your GI toxicities, mucositis or diarrhea. Um, sometimes it would affect your nausea sensor and your CNS, as well as particularly in our young, our young cancer patients, you could also cause sterility and infertility by affecting their sperm count or their, uh, ov um, their ovarian function. And so how do you select the best therapy for a particular patient? Well, in oncology, fortunately, we have, a, um, you know, understanding the disease biology. There's been a lot of work done by our predecessors, and so we have a lot of national professional guidelines based on the prior clinical trials. And so if, if you have a, seeing a patient with, you know, metastatic breast cancer versus metastatic bladder cancer, there are well-published guidelines that have established the, you know, the standard of care that you're able to, um, based on prior clinical trials. And this is important because, you know, in the past, um, some of the, the regiments, each independent academic center or re research consortium will have their favorite regiments for um, a particular um, disease. And so this is an early slide from the early 2000s where we used to primarily at that time use cytotoxic chemotherapy for stage four non-small cell lung cancer. And there were four prevailing regimens that people, that people used. And different sites would use different ones based on practice patterns or um, toxicity. And everybody would have a different idea about which one was the preferred one. But this was, um, this study right here that is on the slide was based on a NCI sponsor cooperative group, which said, okay, well, there seems to be four regimens that are commonly used, which, you know, everybody has a different sense about which one is better, which one is less toxic. Let's see if we can study this in a consistent way. So patients were randomized to one of four arms. And as you see here, the lines are all smushed together for both overall survival as well as time to progression. And so thus, none of the regiments had a better, um, in terms of overall survival, they were all equivalent. However, you know, some of the drugs had different varying toxicities. Some were more toxic to the nerves, others were more toxic to the blood counts um, or to the kidneys. And so this kind of established that, you know, and from, from an efficacy standpoint, these four regiments were um, similar. A similar story happened in lymphoma, where the old school lymphoma treatment was this four drug regimen called CHOP. As you guys understand a little bit more by oncology and go through medicine, you'll recognize that everybody has all of these acronyms um, that we speak in about our diseases and our treatments in. Um, but however, in oncology, we were like the first to kind of always use these acronyms that nobody could understand, and they just got more clever. And so we, the, for lymphoma, it was, it was CHOP. And then other academic centers would develop, they were like, well, if these four drugs work, maybe six, seven, or eight drugs would be better. And so you would have Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson, everybody would have their basic soup or recipe that they claim to be better. And so again, like if a patient went to multiple different centers, they may get four different recommendations because that was the local practice pattern. And so there was again a national search, a national, national clinical trial that looked at four different regimens um, for lymphoma. And this was led by the, the SWA group. So again, a National um, Cancer Institute um, led study. And as you see, the lines are all together. You can't really, it's hard to distinguish one versus the other. All four regiments were thought to be equivalent in terms of efficacy. 
However, in oncology, the more drugs, the more drugs you add, the more potential side effects and toxicities. So this Prome Cytobomb, you know, would definitely be much more toxic than CHOP, as well as MACOP B. And so, you know, what we learned from this trial is that CHOP with our four, with our four drugs was equally equivalent, but less um, toxic than some of the other regimens. So again, kind of the importance of doing well-designed clinical trials and having equipoise versus every place, you know, thinking that their particular practice pattern was, was the best. So, you know, in terms of I wanted to talk a little bit more about endocrine therapy, but maybe I'll pause and see if anybody has any questions about kind of old school chemotherapy. Uh, there are several questions in the chat uh, that you didn't get to, Dr. Han. So, uh, Tom, okay. you want to go first, and then Joe, and then Ellen? Yeah, I can't really see. How do I pull up the chat here? Uh, there should be, if you... I think if it's, those questions were for Dr. Olapate. Oh, those are for Dr. Olapate. Oopsie. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay. Um, any, it may have any questions? before I talk a little bit about endocrine therapy? Um, I have questions after um, Owen stops, okay? If you want to wait to get those to those questions. Okay. Uh, I had a question for now. Um, sure. The studies that you just talked about, did they differ at all in other side effects aside from uh, death and survival rate, or was it all just pretty similar? Um, the lung cancer one, or uh, just like like uh, the studies that added more and more uh, chemotherapies, right? Yeah, no. yeah. So no, so right. So in here, right, definitely every regiment that has kind of like each letter here stands for a different um, chemotherapy drug, and so in general, like promase cytobomb, much more myelosuppressive in terms of so decreasing in your um, bone marrow reserves than, than CHOP um, and as well as um, more nerve toxicity. So in general, more drugs equals more toxicity. Okay, so endocrine therapy. Um, you know, so back to my love and breast cancer. You know, we know that breast cancer is not one disease, and I think Dr. Olapati kind of introduced this concept in terms of having your ER positive, your estrogen receptor positive, luminal A and luminal B, as well as your triple negative, which um, should be part of this basal light cohort, as well as a HER2 um, positive. And a lot of times, our treatment recommendations for breast cancer really depends on the biology, and the bio, you know, the and kind of, I would say in general, it's based on whether a patient is estrogen receptor positive, whether they are HER2 over amplified, or they are triple negative. This is definitely becoming a lot more complex these days, and we're getting to learn about more targets and more genes, and our genomic sequencing is becoming, we're slicing and dicing things more. But this is, I would say, from a bird's eye view, a very general way of how we look at the treatment of breast cancer. And so when we have a woman has estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, we um, think about how do we decrease their estrogens. So in a uh, woman that a premenopausal woman, the main one of the main sources of estrogens is by a, you know through our friends in, in endocrinology pituitary gland through the ovarian signaling, as well as um, in our premenopausal as well as our postmenopausal. We also have a secondary pathway that goes through the adrenal glands where you can have your androgens, estrogens produced via your adrenal glands. So in your postmenopausal woman, where you the ovarian function is, the woman's postmenopausal, so the ovarian function is not part of the picture, this kind of second, uh, this adrenal gland kind of is their primary source of estrogen pro um, production. So kind of based on that and based on the article I gave, um, gave you guys, in terms of how would you consider what would be potential therapeutic targets for a woman with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer? 
Uh, anyone? I guess you can shout it out if you want. I don't. I don't. For some reason, I can't see the chat. But, oh, here. Chat button. Any answers, anyone? You might want to block the estrogen receptor because then it doesn't matter where the estrogen is coming from. Perfect. Right. So blocking the estrogen receptor, which is an old school drug called tamoxifen, has done very well. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So that blocks, it, your body produces the estrogen that it would produce, but it, the effect of the estrogen is, um, receptor is blocked on the breast tissue. Any other? You could remove sources of estrogen, like from the ovaries or through um, androgen. So exactly. So we have this whole term called ovarian suppression. So, you know, a surgical way of doing that is removing one's ovaries, um, which, you know, we may sometimes um, uh, sometimes do in our metastatic patients to remove their, their ovaries. Um, then that used to actually is one of the ways that they kind of dis discovered this whole pathway. A long time ago, we people used to do adrenal nectomies um, to remove that source of pathway. Unfortunately, now we don't have to do that. We have a class of drugs called an aromatase inhibitor, which basically inhibits this pathway and so thus stops the adrenal gland from producing the androgens and estrogens. And so those are drugs called an aromatase inhibitors. And so those, those are the primary pathways uh, that we have. Let's see if I can. And so, right, so we have, you know, in our endocrine therapies, tamoxifen and then aromatase inhibitors. And they definitely have two differential side effects. So tamoxifen, since it's a selective estrogen receptor, you actually see an increase in endometrial cancer because there is actually uptake of the estrogen receptor in the uterus, as well as an increased risk of thrombotic events because of, the, um, of this pathway. However, and you see differential terms in terms of bone effects. So the estrogen is, and for tamoxifen, the, actually the estrogen is modulated to increase in the bone, so that's patient's bone density actually does not decrease, it may increase, whereas the aromatase inhibitors, because you have, I would say, more complete decrease in estrogen produ production, here you have an increased risk of osteoporosis, osteopenia, and bone fractures. So kind of di differential side effects is um, higher risk of bone events with aromatase inhibitors, decreased risk of endometrial cancer, and also kind of a decreased risk of your thrombotic events. Um, does anybody know who this is? No. Any guesses? All right, so all of you guys are Pritzker Pride. This is who you should know. This is Charles Huggins. Um, University of Chicago has lots of Nobel laureates, but Dr. Huggins is our Nobel laureate for medicine. And so his, he actually is, has a main contribution in discovering a, a therapeutic mechanism in prostate cancer with the effect of basically he discovered that the effect of castration in our you know, removal of the testosterone in prostate cancer. And I think it's, um, so one of the things is, um, I really encourage you guys, especially maybe now during quarantine, Maybe you don't have much to do if you get tired of Netflix, read his old paper. It's quite amazing, uh, the work that he did. And think about it maybe as you are putting your own IRBs um, and protocols through the IRB um, and think about like what, you, what the IRB is asking of you versus kind of what Dr. Huggins did. And he did this study in both humans as well as in, he did some uh, mouse work prior to. But what he noticed is, is that and this is kind of done in a long, we didn't have all the fancy and easily access to all the imaging that we have now, that men with metastatic prostate cancer had, a, you know, a lot of them had prostate metastasis in their spine. It was causing an impingement on their spinal canal. They couldn't walk. We're having a lot of weakness. And one of the things they looked at was um, looking at a surrogate marker of a serum test, a serum alkaline phosphatase. And based on some of the laboratory work that he did in mice, he looked at, he recognized that castrating them 
um, that there are a certain prostatases um, actually decrease. And so that's what he did in his patients with metastatic um, prostate cancer. Here is a patient that he did a bilateral orchectomy. And here, these, this is your basically your line. This is the number of days. Here is your, um, your ALK phosphatase with a rapid decline. And what he saw is that um, these patients that he did a bilateral orchiectomy would actually, um, their serum um, ALK phosphatase would decline. And they would actually, because of the response of that on their bone metastasis, they would, in many cases, rega re regain neurologic function in their leg. And then he did a study, and this is kind of where you want to think about kind of, um, he gave some of these men testosterone back. He did the orchiectomy, and then you see the ALK phosphatase continue to increase. So this, Dr. Huggins is kind of well known for this in terms of finding out that um, you know, castration of men, surgical castration actually led to improvement of their metastatic prostate cancer. This is definitely still, I would say, a possible treatment for men with metastatic prostate cancer. However, we typically, um, tend, we'd medically castrate them with injections of an LHRH agonist that works in the pituitary gland with Lupron and Zolodex, just like instead of for females, instead of um, doing BSOs on everyone. I'm going to stop here, and maybe I'm going to go talk a little bit about targeted therapies, but any questions? I actually um, have a question about uh, tamoxifen, a point that you raised sure. earlier. So I, I know that um, so you, you mentioned that tamoxifen kind of competitively inhibits the estrogen receptor, um, and I know that when you're treating premenopausal women, you typically or what I've heard is you typically give tamoxifen and then postmenopausal you would give um, an aromatase inhibitor like arimidex. Um, mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you give tamoxifen in conjunction with arimidex to both like block the receptor and block any estrogen produced through the aromatase enzyme? Is it just because of the, the toxicities involved or is there another yeah. reason for that? So, the, uh, that, so that's, that's an excellent question. That gets into a lot of the clinical trial work. So tamoxifen is one of the older drugs that we use um, in, in breast cancer. And then the, the third generation, there have been many generations of aromatase inhibitors, but the third generation of aromatase inhibitors that we now have available, um, anastrozole, letrozole, SMustane, or some of those, there were clinical trials done to compare in postmenopausal women. Because um, in a premenopausal woman, you don't want to give an aromatase inhibitor without blocking, making the, rendering them postmenopausal first. But so in postmenopausal women, there have been clinical trials where they randomized them to either get tamoxifen versus an aromatase inhibitor versus a combination of the two. And what and there's been lots of different studies of this. I would say when you look at the arms that got tamoxifen versus an aromatase inhibitor. The aromatase inhibitor has always come out to be a little bit better than tamoxifen in terms of progression-free survival, how long women live without their cancer progressing. So that is why in a postmenopausal woman, an aromatase inhibitor is considered the standard of care. Now, when they looked at the arm where they combined the two, um, that was not as, so that, that tended to not be as good as just the aromatase inhibitor. So, and then also you would kind of get double the side effects. So that is what kind of what established an aromatase inhibitor being the preferred drug um, in a postmenopausal woman. Awesome, thank you. Okay. All right, so you know, the big buzz in oncology is targeted therapies. And we all talk about precision medicine and targeted therapies. And there's been a lot of great success stories and there's been some missteps. The, the thing about a targeted therapy is that you need to have a good target. And the hope for targeted therapy is that if you have a good target, you can selectively kill the cancer cells and you can um, spare normal cells. So what, it, what makes a good target in, in oncology? So you want to identify a target that this is, this is a gene or a protein that drives tumor growth that will turn on key mechanisms of cancer um, progression that you could easily inhibit with your drug, it is dispensable in normal drills. So a, a good target would not be prevalent in norm, normal cells, as well as you want to be able to think about how can you measure this target? How can you select out 
which patients have this target and how this target may be modulated by your therapy. So, sorry. So one of the great success stories in breast cancer is this identification of HER2 or ERB2. And this was identified um, by, by Dr. Slayman. And what he found that is about 20% of breast cancer patients over amplify. Their cancer cells had too, much more HER2 re um, receptor versus others. And what he noticed is that those that had over amplification of the HER2 tend to have a more aggressive cancer. And then after this identification, he collaborated with Genentech, and there's actually um, you know, a lot of kind of rich history in this, and they developed a drug, trastuzumab or Herceptin, that is a monoclonal antibody that selectively targets um, this HER2 um, new um, this, this HER2 new gene that is kind of sits on the cell mem membrane. And so uh, Dr. Slayman led a really nice clinical trial, this pivotal trial. And the key thing is here is, is that this is a woman with metastatic breast cancer. He only enrolled patients that had over amplification by immunohistochemistry of HER2. So this was not an all comer study. These were patients that he identified kind of had an enrichment of a target for a therapy that he, um, you know, had, um, the Genentech had developed. Patients were randomized to either receive a, the regular cytotoxic chemotherapy drug that we gave or a combination of the targeted therapy, Herceptin and Paclitaxel. And this is kind of one of the studies that show that given the combination of the Herceptin plus Paclitaxel, in this selected population, um, those that received the targeted therapy of Herceptin had a better outcome in, in terms of overall survival and progression-free survival. And there's a lot of work and a lot of other different clinical trials, I'm really oversimplifying here, that went into this. But about, um, but here's Dr. Slayman. Have you got, he is actually another Pritzker graduate. He got his MD, PhD at Pritzker, and I also believe he was a um, internal medicine resident at University of Chicago before going to um, UCLA. And he has received Hollywood fame um, in this um, Lifetime movie starring Harry Cronkite um, Jr. starring him, and kind of his whole development of this drug and kind of had this following of patients that the development of Herceptin made a really impactful impact in their survival with metastatic breast cancer. But about a, over a decade afterwards, um, in our curative patients, our early stage patients, because Dr. Slayman's first clinical trial was in metastatic, we again looked at combining Herceptin or Trastuzumab with our cytotoxic chemotherapy to see if that made a difference. In another NCI-sponsored clinical trial, patients were randomized to get just plain old cytotoxic chemotherapy or cytotoxic chemotherapy combined with trastuzumab. And the results published, this is my, actually was published my uh, first year as a fellow at University of Chicago. You see that you, typically in oncology, you don't see grass with this big of a split and we get really excited when we see this magnitude of a difference. Um, the patients that received the trastuzumab along with the um, cytotoxic chemotherapy had a much better outcome in terms they were living longer without their disease um, recurring and their, you know, their overall survival was improved as well. So this kind of put, you know, made one of a, a huge impact in terms of beforehand patients with HER2 positive breast cancer had a really bad outcome, but the development of a targeted therapy really changed the story for them. And the story for this population has continued um, um, to develop. And in the paper that I showed you, kind of there's been further drugs, um, pertuzumab being one, or progetta, which actually it's another monoclonal antibody that works to prevent dimerization of the HER2 and the HER3 molecules um, has been developed. And in that clinical trial, they combined you know, standard of care then, trastuzumab plus a taxane or cytotoxic chemotherapy, and then they added pertuzumab to the mix. And so this study was initially reported as positive for the pertuzumab arm in 2012. 
just last year, it was updated in its final overall survival, where patients that got both antibodies had a basically a 16-month improvement in overall survival. So these are patients with stage four um, metastatic breast cancer, HER2 over expressing living 56 months on average. So, you know, again, identifying a target and kind of appropriately studying it in a selected population, you're seeing these big differences in outcomes. The HERS 2 story, um, there actually is, um, in the, the paper I got you, talks a little bit more about the trastuzumab and man stain, and this is a really cool technology. It's kind of the antibody drug conjugate. This is one of the first ones we used in oncology. There are many others, but this is kind of like typical the Trojan horse where it uses the HER2 as a kind of honing signal to deliver an otherwise pretty cytotoxic drug that um, we hadn't been able to give systemically because it was too um, harmful to normal cells. And so HER2 is a honing device. So those cells that overexpress the HER2, so the cancer cells, then selectively envelop the drug, which then has creates cell death. So and we, this is a kind of a, um, a mechanism that we uh, have in lymphoma and many other types of cancer um, been developed. So that's the HER2 story, which has been a great success story. But there haven't there hasn't always been great success stories in the cancer. And one of the ones that had kind of a very slow start was the uh, epidermal growth factor receptor, the EGRF. Um, and so that in lung cancer, which you know has been historically one of the cancers we had not been able to make great progress with. In lung cancer, when you look at what is driving the biology, you know, it's been very hard to identify a target that we could actually develop a therapeutic for. And so you see there's lots of small little pieces of the pie, and EGRF was a sizable one here, but this was about 15%. And in patients that had EGRF over amplification, they thought that this target kind of worked to increase invasion and metastasis and increase proliferation of um, the cancer cell. And so, you know, EGRFS was thought to be a pivotal role in tumor genesis and disease progression. It seemed to be in a subset of non-small cell lung cancers increasingly um, aberrantly expressed. And those patients that had a high level of EGRFS had a poor prognosis. And so, you know, there's a development of EGRF inhibitors, gefitinib and erlotinib were some of the first two. There are now others. And these are oral drugs, so oral tyrosine kinase drugs that inhibited EGRF. And so this was gained a lot of excitement. And when I was a first-year fellow, people thought gefitinib and erlotinib was going to do wonders. Oncologists did what oncologists did. They combined this oral medication plus the uh, cytotoxic chemotherapies, and they thought that this was going to make a huge difference. But unfortunately, it didn't. So when they, this is a clinical trial that was again um, performed, and what happened was is that they gave patients IV drug versus two different doses of gefitinib versus a placebo, and as you see, the curves are superimposable. It did not make a difference. One of the reasons is is that Instead of versus in Dr. Slayman's trial, where he selectively enrolled patients that overexpressed HER2, this study actually enrolled any lung cancer, a non-small cell stage four lung cancer patient. And so then, you know, people begin to realize, well, why is this, you know, question, why is this great drug? How come the clinical trial was negative? But then, you know, people begin to realize that maybe there seems to be a certain population of patients that seem to do better with this drug than others. And then there are these reports that patients that were doing better with these drugs happen to be of Asian descent, female, had a histology of adenocarcinoma, and were non-smokers. And a group out in Harvard led by Thomas Lynch actually took a group of these patients that were doing well on this drug and sequenced their EGFR gene. And thus, they, he realized that those patients kind of had a collection of mutations in the catalytic kinase domain. So then I think kind of the, you know, so initially, um, gefitinib, everybody's kind of the balloon, let the air out, you know, was not the, the big drug that everybody was promising. But then people kind of gathered themselves together and thought of a, a 
better design of a clinical trial. And this trial was done by Tony Mock. It was the, it was the Asian IPASS study. And so it looked at and is selectively enrolled in Japan and Korea. And it enrolled patients that had ano, so of course Asians, which is one of the key groups, ano carcinoma histology, ex um, never smokers or light smokers. And it randomized them to gefitinib versus the cytotoxic chemotherapy. So again, we're not just adding it to it, we're, we're gonna compare the two. It did not you know, select it based on the EGFR mutation, but it did kind of explore it afterwards. And so when they got these results, what they found is when they kind of went back and they took the tissue and they did the EGFR mutation analysis, those that actually had the mutation, the oral drug gefitinib did much better than just the cytotoxic chemotherapy. However, those without the mutation, the um, oral drug did not do as well. And so I think this is, you know, then people realize, you know what, it wasn't that the drug was bad, it's just that we did, weren't smart enough to A, select the patient, and so instead of, you know, now with these targeted therapies, we just can't, A, just combine it with our cytotoxic, and we just can't, we can't, we have to be very thoughtful in picking out the patients that are going to have, um, that kind of selectively have the target that we are trying to inhibit. So I think now this, you know, these studies kind of led, so now in lung cancer, we have a patient with newly diagnosed non-small cell lung cancer. The standard of care is to do genomic sequencing to discover not only do they have this EGRF mutation, but do they have other mutations like the ALK rearrangement that we now have th um, therapies for. So I think it's kind of we've learned through some of our missteps. So again, all of these are kind of biomarkers, and so these are the cornerstone of personalized medicine. When we talk about biomarkers, I want you to think about, you talk about two different types. One is a prognostic biomarker. And a prognostic biomarker is one that kind of differentiates which patients are going to do well versus patients that are going to do poorly. Versus a predictive biomarker is kind of predicts which patient would benefit from a specific therapy. And again, kind of in our targeted therapy, the holy grail is that we have a biomarker and a targeted therapy that has a high clinical benefit and low toxicity. So kind of with that, to kind of like test your knowledge, um, what uh, what biomarkers have we discussed? I think we discussed her two. Mm hmm. All right, her two. What other? And is her two predictive or prognostic? I'm not entirely clear on the distinction, actually. Okay, so so right, so so I think it's, and I probably didn't really actually get into a lot of the different prognostic things, but and um, so if HER2, so prior to the development of like I would say trastuzumab, patients that had HER2 overall amplification had a worse prognosis than those that did not have HER2 amplification, so it was prognostic in that respect, but with the development of trastuzumab that is now also, so it's prognostic for a poor um, outcome, but now trastuzumab, it, you know, it predicts a great outcome or a great benefit from the drug trastuzumab. Yeah, actually, maybe any I, other? Yeah, let me just add a little bit to that question. So, um, you know, triple negative breast cancer, for example, everyone thinks it's associated with a very, um, aggressive feature and a poor prognosis. There's a very big difference between prognosis and predictive biomarker. It turns out the first paper I actually published in breast cancer at the University of Chicago was to look at the long uh, standing database that they had put together in the Department of Radiation Oncology, especially after we started using tamoxifen to target estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And one of the things I found that was really fascinating was that a lot of our patients who got chemotherapy for triple negative breast cancer, 
once the cancer didn't come back, they just stayed completely without uh, recurrence. And this happens to about, depending on the database, about maybe I would say 30 to 40% of patients who are fortunate to have their triple negative breast cancer uh, diagnosed early, and then they respond to chemotherapy. And so those early papers actually showed us that triple negative breast cancer was the best to respond to chemotherapy. And that's why we started pumping chemotherapy into a lot of women. And a lot of women actually survived because we had chemotherapy. It wasn't until Dennis Lehman came along and got us Herceptin that a cancer that was the deadliest now became the most treatable because we had a target. And of course, if you look at estrogen receptor, it is a target. It's just that it's a target that leads to apoptosis. It has its me uh, predominant mechanisms and it doesn't kill cancer cells. It just starves it of, of, of its growth factor. So now what we're finding is that patients with ER positive breast cancer actually continue to have a risk of relapse and a risk of recurrence. And you know, in the most recent data, it's even worse prognosis if you look 20 years down the line. They're the ones who continue to have this indolent disease that just stays there, doesn't die, lives in your body, and keeps relapsing several years afterwards. So that's why when we begin to talk about metastasis, inhibiting metastasis, we're now really, really, ex really interested in what gets cancer cells to stay dormant in the body and then relapse 15 years later. And so when we begin now to talk about aggressive features, aggressive molecular subtypes, we're now adding it predictive. Is it predictive or prognostic? And when we need our predictive biomarkers to help us use the right treatment at the right time. Okay. All right. Right. So I think it was that for me, kind of the, the some of the biomarkers, estrogen, HER2, the EGFR was at one. And then, um, you know, I think it kind of in the sake of time, since we're being recycler based time, we are even beginning to have biomarkers for chemotherapy for our um, estrogen receptor positive. And so I'm, I think I'm going to skip this por portion um, here, just... Uh, but there is one question here from Vivek. How do they get away with giving gefitinib and no chemotherapy to people without GFR mutations? Um, that does not seem to be um, equipoise. So I think so at the time that that study was developed, so gefitinib actually was approved in kind of a later line setting. And, you know, they thought that since they were selecting patients, kind of that had those great clinical characteristics, which did not always necessarily lead to the genomic EGFR mutation. Um, you know, since that population, the Asian adeno non-smokers seemed to have greater benefit um, versus um, chemotherapy. At that time, I think, you know, when that study was designed, it was, you know, it was thought to kind of be, um, have equipoise. And in fact, Jafitinib was an approved drug to be given in later line in um, non-small cell lung cancer. Any other questions? Is that the end of your talk, Owen? Yeah, I, I mean, I think... Yeah, no, I... I, I had a couple more slides, but I kind of think you know, basically I'll just, my, my last slide here, kind of a take home message, you know, so, you know, development of our therapies, um, you know, definitely de requires well-designed clinical trials, but, you know, in order to do that, we need to kind of under, have good understanding of the disease biology, as well as a good understanding of our of mechanisms of therapy, especially when you consider targeted therapies. So. Great, all right, well, thank you very much. Um, I guess with that, we'll, and uh, just a quick update.